You're listening to Ask the Expert on Sprott Money News. Thank you, listeners, for joining us today on Ask the Expert. My name is Nathan McDonald, Sprott Money News, and we are very excited to have the pleasure of speaking with Peter Schiff this morning. Peter Schiff is CEO and Chief Global Strategist of Euro-Pacific Capital, Inc. As an internationally recognized economist and financial analyst, he is known for spotting trends long before mainstream analysts and his vocal views on the economy and financial markets. He's a radio host of the U.S. nationally syndicated Peter Schiff Show, heard daily at SchiffRadio.com. His latest book is How an Economy Grows and Why It Crashes, The Collector's Edition. An updated economic parable he co-wrote with his brother, Andrew Schiff. With this, I am pleased to welcome Peter Schiff. Good morning, Peter. Good morning. And, you know, by the way, the the last book that I did, The Real Crash, America's Coming Bankruptcy, I have a revised and updated version of that book, which is quite lengthy. There's over, I think, over 100 new pages of text. And that book is set to uh, be released in, in February. So I think it's, it's a good read, especially if you didn't get uh, the original copy. But even if you did, there's a lot of new material in uh, the revised edition of The Real Crash. Great. We'll have to keep our eyes out for that. Um, Peter, as you know, Janet Yellen was recently confirmed as the new Fed chairman. She begins her new position starting in February. Many experts are predicting that Janet Yellen will be even more dovish than Ben Bernanke. What is your opinion on Janet Yellen? Well, this is an instance where the experts are probably right. Uh, I, I do believe she'll be more dovish. Uh, if you know, Some people might think, how is that even possible? Uh, well, because I think the circumstances uh, will uh, force her to adopt that, that position. But, you know, I think the interesting thing about this, uh, you know, the Yellen coronation and, you know, the the, the circumstances is you've got Ben Bernanke is leaving at a time where everybody is convinced that he did a wonderful job. He was the savior of the economy. Uh, He had the the right policy. He was the right man at the right time. I mean, what a great, uh, you know, fortunate situation that the guy that was an expert in the Great Depression just happened to be – uh, Fed chairman, right when we needed him, because, you know, it might have been a repeat of the Great Depression had he not been so smart and so learned. He knew exactly what to do, and everything is great because Janet Yellen is a protege. Janet Yellen was by his side, and after all, Janet Yellen was the one person that saw the housing bubble, right, when nobody else did. This is all a, a, a fairy tale, but it's very reminiscent of the way Wall Street and the media looked at Ben Bernanke when he replaced Alan Greenspan, because Alan Greenspan left in 06, right? The bubble hadn't burst yet. Everybody still thought he was the maestro. Everybody held Alan Greenspan in very high regard. They were praising what a great tenure he had, because, you know, he had been Fed chairman since 87, and everything was great, and everybody was excited because they believed that Ben Bernanke was going to follow the successful policies of Alan Greenspan, and what happened? You know, two years later, the 2008 financial crisis, the world blew up, uh, and the problem was that nobody really understood what a lousy Fed chairman Alan Greenspan was, because all the things that he did laid the foundation for the 08 financial crisis. Well, Ben Bernanke has been even worse than Alan Greenspan, and the policies that he pursued are going to blow up on Janet Yellen in an even more spectacular way then the Greenspan policies blew up on, on Bernanke. And so everybody is optimistic. They think everything is great, just the way they did in 2006. They have no idea what's coming because it's going to be much worse than 08, and it's going to be met with much more inflationary monetary policies coming out of Yellen. And if you can imagine, as bad as Bernanke and Greenspan were, they were Republicans. Yellen is a Democrat. You know, so, so this is not going to be an improvement. So it, as bad as it was, it's going to be that much worse. So you think it's going to be Ben Bernanke on uh, Hyperdrive? Yeah, well, Ben Bernanke, you know, not, not, maybe not in steroids, but, uh, but yeah, it's the same policies. And, and uh, Janet Yellen is a real Keynesian, real, you know, believing in we, we've got to print money, we've got to create jobs, we've got to help the unemployed. And, you know, she thinks that the way you do that is to create inflation, although, you know, they're not going to call it that. But she is, you know, she is going to sacrifice the dollar because she thinks that that's where 
the econ- economic growth comes from. I mean, she's going to try to keep people spending. She's going to try to satisfy all the Democratic constituencies and special interest groups. And it's just going to be uh, pedal to the metal. And, of course, everybody is now convinced that, you know, you can print as much money as you want and you don't have to worry about inflation, which, of course, is ridiculous because that is inflation. But a- according, you know, to what's happened recently, right, we've had all this quantitative easing, and people like me were criticizing this and said, look, this is inflation, this is bad, right? But since the government has been able to fool everybody with the CPI into believing that there's no inflation, and because we've been able to export a lot of that inflation to the emerging markets that trade us their goods for our inflation, our paper money, everybody is now convinced that there's nothing, there's no downside to QE, that we can print all the money we want, and those of us who were worried about it a few years ago, well, we were completely wrong. Because, look, we've been proven wrong by, by the statistics. So there's going to be no objection whatsoever to doubling down, tripling down on QE. I mean, $85 billion a month is nothing. Wait till Janet Yellen is doing $150 billion a month or $200 billion a month in money printing. You know, because, you know, whatever they do, if it doesn't work, which we know it won't work, right, you can't grow the economy by debasing the currency, right? So it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. The more QE they do, the bigger the fire gets. So they're going to do even more because that's all that they've got. The only thing Yellen can do is print money. She can't lower interest rates because they're already at zero. She is starting off. She's being handed 0% interest rates. So the next crisis that happens, there's no rate cutting because rates are already cut to the bone. All she can do is expand the QE program that everybody believes the Fed is about to taper. Not a chance. I mean, even if they do a trivial taper, uh, I mean, it's not going to last long because they're going to have to undo it pretty quick because the only reason the economy looks like it's recovering on the surface is because it's a bubble, and it depends on an increasing amount of QE, not even the same amount. You can't even sustain this bubble with $85 billion a month of QE, it's going to need more, just like any, you know, any drug addict. You, know, you build up tolerance. So if you want to stay high, you need more and more drugs to maintain that, that high. Well, the U.S. economy needs more and more of a QE drug to, to stop it from imploding. But, of course, the problem is eventually you OD on it, and the dollar crashes, and then you have an even worse crisis, which, unfortunately, is the one that's coming. Which that leads me to my next question, Peter. So until recently, um, obviously, the Fed was doing its double speak, and it was saying taper on, taper off, taper on, taper off. Now um, they announced that there is a – it's a taper. It's obviously not anything that great. Um, it hasn't even begun yet, but the market seems to think everything's going to be okay as soon as they do taper. And like you were just previously alluding to, so do you think Janet Yellen will allow that taper to happen, or do you think she's going to come up with another strategy to compensate for it? No, no, she's going to call it off, but she's going to try to think of an excuse as to why. I mean, we're going to have some economic data that is going to disappoint. Everybody is looking for good news, and when, we, when they don't get it, the Fed is going to have to act surprised and say, well, you know, we were planning on tapering, but since, you know, this happened, then maybe they'll find some, something to blame it on. Uh, they'll say, well, we, weren't, we were surprised by this. And so, you know, because the Fed is claiming they're data dependent. The Fed isn't saying we're going to taper no matter what. They're saying we're going to taper as long as the data supports it. So they leave themselves an out, which they know they're going to use. The data is not going to support the taper. Whatever the data is, the Fed's going to rationalize why it doesn't support it. Because they know that if they withdraw their monetary props, the economy will collapse because what they've created is not a real recovery that is sustainable. It is an artificial, phony recovery that will go away the minute the Fed stops supporting it. Of course, it will go away eventually even if the Fed does support it, but you know, they're more concerned about the here and now, not what's uh, in the long-term interest of the economy. So they are not going to uh, follow through with their plans of, of ending QE. I mean, I think the Fed knows that, but – the maybe what's almost as scary for the Fed is tapering, is admitting that they can't do it, because that'll that'll be the end of the party. Everybody just assumes that we can go back to normal, that we can have normal interest rates, and the Fed can shrink the balance sheet, and the economy will keep going. That's impossible. You can't do that any more than you know you you you, you can take away oxygen and, and and expect you know humans to to continue to breathe. They they can't. So 
when people realize the phony nature of the recovery and that it's, it's only temporary and it's not real and it's all because of QE, then they stop factoring in an end of it and they realize that it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's a game changer. It's a game changer for the dollar. It's a game changer for treasuries. It's a game changer for gold when people wake up to the reality because right now they're all living in a delusion. So, Peter, why do you think they are in that delusion? Why do you think they continue to believe this, even though in you know there's glaring evidence suggesting that they can't end QE? If they ended QE outright, the whole economy would collapse. So why do you think the market continues to believe in that illusion? Because they never get it. I mean, you know, I mean, remember, think back to the days of the housing bubble, or at least the last housing bubble, not the current housing bubble, but the one that blew up in 2008. I mean, to me, it was extremely obvious what was going on. Right? I knew it was a housing bubble, and I knew that the minute the bubble burst, the economy would implode in a way that we had never seen since the Great Depression. You know, I wrote a book about it, you know, in 2005, the, you know, 2006, came out in February of 2007, you know, a, a crash proof. But I saw the, the problems for the banks. I knew that the banks had loaned all this money on inflated real estate collateral, and that when real estate prices go down, I knew the banks would fail. I knew that Americans were spending money based on the fantasy of home equity. I knew how important home equity was to the consumer and that when the home equity went away, the consumer spending would go away, our entire economy would implode because it was based on this never-ending stream of home equity extractions and low interest rates. It was so crystal clear to me. I didn't understand how so many people could not see it, how all I did was get into argument after argument with everybody about what to me was so obvious. And, and then the whole thing fell apart, and now all of a sudden people started to get it. I mean, people that didn't get it before when I tried to point out the absurdity of 0% down and negative AM mortgages and liar's loans, nobody thought that was a problem in 2006. But everybody recognized it in 2008. Okay, yes, it was a problem. But it was a problem before, but nobody saw it. Or during the dot-com bubble in the late 1990s, I mean, again, I felt like a loan – you know, the fool that wasn't buying the dot-com stocks, the one guy that didn't get it. It seems so obvious to me that these that was a bubble, uh, yet it wasn't obvious to anybody who was buying uh, the dot-com stocks. So it's never obvious to the masses. I mean, whatever it is about groupthink uh, that, 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 that clouds people's judgment and their rationale, uh, and so many people have a vested interest in believing in something that they kind of like – build a mental wall around themselves and the facts so that they can't acknowledge it because it's not as comfortable as accepting the fantasy. So this is how it is. You know, everybody gets it wrong until something happens to shake them, and now they see that they were wrong. And so this is the position that I've been in. And I'm not unique. I mean, look at, look at you know, Eric Sprott. I mean, you know, I mean, he sees stuff in advance, you know, but the problem is there's so few of us. We're in the minority. Uh, the ones that get it, you know, the ones that can understand what everybody else doesn't. And, and what happens is initially they say you're a broken record, you're a perma bear, you're a stop clock, because even when you're eventually right, they don't give you any credit because they say, oh, you've been saying that for years. Well, of course, because you have to see it years in advance, you know, you know, to notice it. And it's not because, gee, I'm, I'm just saying the same thing. And, you know, when people, if they go back and the people that try to put that stop clock label on me about the housing bubble, but when you go back and look at the things that I read, what I wrote, and, and listen to what I said, I, I said exactly what was going to happen and why it was going to happen and all the little details. It wasn't like I was just spouting that the sky is falling, you know, and then eventually it fell and I took credit for it. You know, but you, the people that can see it understand it, and they understand it early, and they see it early, and that's how you make money. You know, people made a lot of money when the housing market collapsed if they bet the right way and they, and they had the courage of their convictions. People made a lot of money when the dot-com bubble for burst if they had the courage of their convictions. And I think even more money is going to be made when this bubble bursts. The people who have their investments in the right place. Not the people who are chasing the crowd and short-term performance, but the people who understand the big picture and don't care if, you know, people want to make fun of them and people want to laugh at them, but they have the courage to do the right thing, not the popular thing. They're going to make a ton of money. It seems like they're almost uh, like pathological liars, like somebody that says the, spouts the same nonsense over and over again that they eventually uh, believe it. Um, mm -hmm. 
but Peter, another fallacy that the Fed likes to spread is that inflation is mild and under control. In their opinion, inflation is too low, and they are horribly <laughs> afraid of deflation, which is humorous. Do you believe inflation is as low as the Fed would have us believe? And why are they so scared of deflation when, in my opinion, deflation is a good thing for people? Well, of course. I mean, the best thing for people is that prices come down. I mean, we all know that. I mean, Given the choice, would you rather buy something for a high price or buy something for a low price? I mean, we all want low prices. I mean, nobody advertises. If you're in business, you don't advertise. We've got the highest prices. You know, come shop here. I mean, you get customers by lowering prices. I mean, look at the success of Walmart. It's everyday low prices, not everyday high prices. Nobody would shop at the everyday high price store. Uh, I mean, and, and, and people respond to sales. People buy more when the price goes down. They don't buy more when the price goes up, especially if you have a limited amount of money. I mean, if you're poor or, you know, lower middle class or middle class, I mean, you're going to buy more stuff when the price comes down. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you're Warren Buffett, I suppose it doesn't matter what things cost because you have enough money that it doesn't matter. But if you're living on a budget, uh, there are a lot of things that you can't afford and you don't buy it. Well, if you can't afford something, how do, how do you afford it? It's when the price comes down. Then you afford it. I mean, how many people have cell phones today? They didn't have cell phones in the late 1980s. I mean, they had cell phones in the 1980s. Some people had them if you were really, really rich. But most people didn't have them because they couldn't afford them. But when the price came down, then they bought them. If the price had never gone down, if cell phones had just gone up in price, then nobody would own them today. Same thing with, you know, computers and the same thing with, you know, uh, plasma TV sets. The things that everybody owns today – were things that just rich people owned uh, yesterday. Uh, but the reason that everybody owns them now is because the price came down. And that's what you want. I mean, that's the goal of an economy, is to produce more stuff so you have abundance and you have lower prices. And, and that's what happened in America for the 19th century. That's what built our middle class. We built the middle class on the foundation of falling prices. And where did falling prices come from? Increased production. Uh, and, and, and as you produce more and you find more efficient ways of producing and using your resources, uh, then you pass on those efficiencies to your customers with lower prices, and everybody has a higher standard of living. But the reason the government wants to convince everybody that something good is bad is because that something, what's good for us is bad for the government because the government is in a very different situation than than, you know, than, than a lot of other consumers would be. The government, number one, is the world's biggest debtor. When you have trillions and trillions of dollars of debt and it's impossible to pay it off, the only thing you can do other than default is to inflate it away. So if you're a massive debtor, you need inflation. You need to have the value of your debt reduced through inflation. So what you need to do is convince the public that inflation is good for everybody, but it's really good for the government. The government also is trying to keep the economy propped up with cheap money and 0% interest rates. Well, the only reason the Fed can justify 0% interest rates is by saying there's no inflation. If the Fed acknowledged that inflation was 3 or 4 or 5%, they would have to raise interest rates because they can't say that that's an acceptable level of inflation, that the Fed is willing to tolerate that. So the only way that the Fed – can get away with keeping interest rates as low as they are is to pretend that inflation is a lot lower than it really is and to pretend that the threat is deflation, that they have to have this ultra-low interest rates policy just as an insurance policy against deflation, even though there's nothing to insure against because there's nothing wrong with it. If you think about it, deflation as falling prices. I mean, think about it. If prices, you know, we have, according to the Fed, according to the government, inflation is running at 1% or 2% a year, which is too low because it, it, we're too close to the danger zone where prices might actually drop by a half a percent a year or a percent a year. Well, what is wrong with that? Well, according to the Federal Reserve, if prices are going to drop by 1% a year, nobody will shop. Everybody is going to stop consuming, which is such a bunch of nonsense. Like if there's something that I need and that I want to buy and it's $100, Am I going to say, you know, I'm not going to buy it for a year because next year I can buy it for $99? Nobody is going to think like that. At the same time, does somebody think that 2% inflation, the magic number, is going to cause me to buy something that I don't even need? 
hey, here's something that costs $100. I don't even need it. I might need it in a year, and it might cost $102 in a year. So I'm going to rush out and buy it right now. Nobody does that. This is all nonsense to try to say that you know, the economy would implode if prices went down by 1%, but it's great if they go up by 2%. I mean, this is nonsense, but the Fed has to create this. And the other thing, what, the other thing that the government needs is the government has all kinds of obligations. Not only do they have bonds, but they have obligations, Social Security, Medicare. They don't want to tell people on Social Security that we promise more than we can pay. We have to cut your benefits. So the only way they can politically cut the benefits, right, in a way that, you know, doesn't backfire them is inflation. What they have to do is inflate away the benefits that they don't have the guts to legislate away. So we have all these reasons that the government wants inflation. Of course, Wall Street loves inflation, so they don't want to spill the beans. They're making a fortune off inflation because they get to get all this money cheap from the Fed, and then they use it to buy assets. And so they, they get rich. I mean, there's always some people getting rich off of inflation, but the problem is, Somebody else is getting poor to, to make it possible. And the people who are getting bled dry are the middle class and the poor who are getting killed, and, of course, the whole economy. And as the Fed does this and the government does this, you're going to have social and political unrest because you, now you widen the divide between the haves and the have-nots. You get this 99%, 1%, or 0.1%, and now you know, the society can break up because there's all this resentment and envy, and, and, and a lot of the concern is justifiable, but they, they're, they're not blaming the right people. They're going to they're gonna vilify the success, you know, the people who are successful. They're not going to understand it's the system that's doing it. And what the system is is big government, central banking, cheap money. That's what's destroying the fabric of society, but they're not going to know that. They're just going to blame it on some rich guy. That leads me to another thing, Peter. Um, a lot of people just – they don't want to believe the truth. They're so dependent on the system now that they, they need to believe that that is the truth. Well, why would you want to believe the truth when the lie is so much better? Exactly. You know, it's so much so easier. Much, it's so much more comfortable to believe in the lie. It's just like, look, what's easier for a little kid to believe in Santa Claus or that there's no Santa Claus? You know, so you – know, and, and it's not good when the little kid – when he finds out that you know, if you tell a little kid – you know, five, six-year-old kid. There's no Santa Claus. He's gonna cry. He's not gonna be happy about it. You know, he doesn't want. He doesn't want to be told the truth. It's much better to believe in the fairy tale, right? Because it's fun. And so, you know, nobody wants to know the truth. Least of all the politicians, because they, they don't. They, they don't want to have to level with the voters. They don't want to have to tell the voters the truth. Because what's going to happen then? They, they might not get reelected. So, you know, everybody wants to conv- believe this very convenient, comfortable lie. And as long as the lie is going, everybody's making money. Look, how many people were making money in the real estate market before the housing bubble blew in 2008, right? People were making fortunes. People were buying second homes, third homes. I mean, all these real estate millionaires. You know, they, they, they were making a ton of money. You think, you think they wanted that party to end? People wanted it to go on forever. The same thing in the dot-com. Remember all the dot-com millionaires, all the 20-somethings that were instant millionaires when their money-losing you know, dot-com went public? Remember, like, the globe.com and all these companies? No one wanted that to end. Now it's all over again with social media. You know, I mean, it's all get, with, get rich quick, you know, and nobody wants to, to stop that, but it's going to end because it's all, it's all phony. So the moral story is you can believe what you want, but reality will come true at one point. It's going to assert itself. 